Hi, everybody. It's Kathleen from GGP, and I'm um, really excited tonight to introduce you to two amazing writers. Um, they're both um, have written just incredible memoirs, and Aliyah Boltz is going to be talking to Rose Anderson, the author of Heart and The Heart and Other Monsters. And um, this book will absolutely break your heart and I can't even wait to hear the discussion. So ladies, welcome to GGP Zoom. Thank you, Hi, Kathleen. Thank you. Hello. Hi, everybody out there. Hi, Rose. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to talk about this book. I, Rose and I had the opportunity to meet this year in San Antonio, and I brought a galley of this home with me. And then I read it and I was like, I wish I had read it before before we saw each other in person because I have so many questions. I was just, <laughs> I was blown away by this book and really moved by it um, and, and surprised by the commonalities between our, our two projects. And, you know, there, there's just a, a lot to unpack in this. Um, <laughs> But it's, I, I think it's such a it's such a fascinating and 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 uh, and and moving and disturbing work, and I, I really love that about it. Um, always with memoir, we hope to, as readers, we hope to find something universal, something that speaks to us, that's going to to speak to any reader. And there's plenty of that here. But as a child of the Northern California hippie community, <laughs> I. You were this book. It speaks about a world that I know intimately. Um, but whereas I kind of grew up on the lighter side of this same universe, it was almost rose like you were in the upside down world, like the Stranger Things upside down world. Um, Absolutely, such a familiar milieu, though. And um, well, I do. You want to read a little bit about sure about Rick and then we'll kind of go from there. Sure. So um, I'm going to read a little bit about my stepfather um, who was part of this hippie activism world that we are so familiar with <laughs> um, and everyone should read his book Home Baked which is incredible and completely different from mine in the best way possible. And I can't speak highly enough of your memoir. So um, yeah, I'm just gonna read a modified version of a chapter on, on, a, on a hippie man. <laughs> All right. Rick was a well-known and revered activist, lauded for his peaceful but persistent approach to environmental and anti-nuclear issues. He was mildly famous within progressive circles in large part because of an incident involving a Crystal Eagle and Ronald Reagan that landed him in prison. In the early 1990s, Rick founded the 100th Monkey Project, a series of concerts, concerts and demonstrations to bring together anti-nuclear activists. In 1992, a few thousand people gathered in Nevada near the nuclear test site for a weekend of activism. On the final day of the event, Many of those involved traveled to Las Vegas to hold a demonstration outside the Department of Energy's office. That same day, Rick, using a borrowed press pass, was allowed into the luncheon honoring Ronald Reagan. The former president had been presented with a large crystal eagle and was speaking to a room full of his devotees, the National Association of Broadcasters, who had awarded him with the statue. Rick snuck onto the stage, smashed the 30 pound eagle and stepped forward to the microphone saying, excuse me, President Reagan. He had planned to give an impassioned speech against nuclear testing, but instead half a dozen secret servicemen tackled him while more risked Reagan away to safety. In the video of the event, still available to watch on YouTube, I think it's labeled crazy man attacks Reagan. <laughs> uh, the shards of crystal look like shrapnel as they fly over the former president's head. Reagan was not harmed, but Rick, after various legal battles, was sentenced to around a year in prison in order to pay a $2,000 fine, cementing his status as hero to the cause. One morning when I was 15 years old, Rick threw a heavy wooden chair at my head because I had failed to clean up the cream cheese from my breakfast. The chair missed, crashing into the wall beside me and cracking into two pieces. 
He berated me as I shut my eyes and hoped my car carpool to school, which was honking a friendly hello from our driveway, couldn't hear my threats. Rick was privately a terrible alcoholic who was emotionally abusive to me, my sister, and my mom. My mother did not know this when they first got together. He didn't drink in front of us initially, though it's hard to remember when that changed. I do remember when my mother found hundreds and hundreds of bottles and cans inside the wall of our gar garage, and when Sarah, my younger sister, six years old, dumped out a backpack full of beer bottle caps onto our stepmom's table and said, see, I told you he drinks a lot. Eventually, his alcoholism and anger lived openly with us all the time. Rick suffered from depression and spoke often of suicide. He made attempts at emotional growth. He joined a men's group where guys beat drums around a fire pit and talked about masculinity, and he tried family counseling on occasion. He attended AA on and off for years. His coping skills, however, seemed fairly limited to drinking and passing on the abuse he himself had faced. I believe that he thought love and respect were the offspring of fear. He used to say he wished he could take a pill and poof, disappear from everyone's memory. Where the physical violence managed to dismiss us, the emotional abuse hit its, it hit its target squarely. When my sister and I began to develop breasts and butts, Rick routinely called us fat and lazy, looking away from our curves as though uncomfortable with pubescent bodies. His nickname for my sister was Piggy. He disliked when one of us talked about something he didn't understand. He had not gone to college and got upset when he felt his intelligence was challenged. He routinely called us spoiled American brats. Despite the fact that we lived off my mother's artist and residency stipend, and a little help from my grandmother. He said to my mom, everything would be great if you just did exactly what I said all the time. My mother once lit Rick's spike on fire. When she couldn't get it to start, I was the one who handed her a container of lighter fluid from the garage. She had found out he was cheating. His, her first response was to throw rocks at the woman's window, aiming for the windows, while Rick sat inside. When that proved unsatisfactory, she drove furiously home and set aflame the bike and cart he had used to travel across the country multiple times, one of his favorite things. My mom, Sarah, and I stood in the driveway while it burned, watching the dark smoke drift toward the bay. I can still remember her face, angry but satisfied, her blue eyes turning a steely gray. My mother left Rick permanently in 2006. The last thing he ever said to me at the end of a screaming fight when I was close to 20 years old was that one day I would come find him and thank him for how he parented me. In 2010, Rick married a woman in front of a small group of family and friends. Two weeks later, he woke up and shot himself in the head. That was an amazing reading. Um, oh, thank you. <laughs> I mean, you brought tears to my eyes. I mean... Oh. You know, I, I, I think that, that people don't understand what exactly it's like to grow up in the backdrop of, of, of that kind of abuse. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that or do you feel comfortable? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting, especially when you have someone who publicly presents um, as so important to a cause that a lot of us believe in, right? Like he was an incredible environmentalist and an anti-nuclear activist and taught nonviolence workshops for a great deal of his life. And so people to this day are still sort of in disbelief that this is how he was privately. So that was really hard for me to contend with growing up. Um, sort of like people would say, you must, you're so lucky to have a stepdad like Rick because to them, he was this amazing figure. Um, and to me, he was a jerk <laughs> who made my life pretty miserable. So uh, it's been interesting and freeing as I've gotten older and become more okay with being critical of my own community <laughs> uh, to finally be able to talk about it a little bit more because I think that it can be really hard within any given community to call out people's heroes. Well, I mean, I think that's, that's what's shattering about, about 
you know, what you write about is, is we all have a preconceived notion of, of who people are and, and to have it completely turned upside down is stunning. Yeah, no, it's, it's, I mean, it was a surprise to me too, because when I met him, you know, he was presented as this activist who wanted to save the world and then to have it be, you know, the opposite at home for all the peace he wanted for everyone else. He didn't want to bring that into our house. So that was very, very difficult to reckon with. And he was clearly a very um, troubled man. I don't think that he was happy. And, you know, I, I do have compassion for his mental health issues. Hi. <laughs> Hi, you're back. <laughs> My computer crashed and we started swiftly. So here we are. Um, <laughs> The world uh, of Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> we um, you never know what's going to happen next. Yeah, <laughs> I I I love that excerpt, and um, I was so struck by it for several reasons. For one thing, I'm pretty sure that my dad was in the same drum beating men's group. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. <laughs> My mom led nonviolent <laughs> resistance workshops in Willits, mm -hmm. which uh, people may or may not know is about an hour and a half, maybe, from, yeah. from where you were at. So, um, mm -hmm. and, and so it's, it's a world that I know really well. And I also, even though you know, my family had a different kind of darkness and a different kind of light, as I, I, I think we all do, one of the things I, 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 I know that guy too, though. It's mm -hmm. like, that's a particular kind of back to the land hippie. And one of the things that uh, I was also writing against in my book um, is a tendency that, that we have to, to of course, stereotype any, any subculture, right? But hippie culture Absolutely. gets stereotyped in this one particular way. And you see it again and again and again, these, you know, peace and love space ball hippies. And in fact, <laughs> there's the whole complicated range of humanity and there are business oriented people and you know very together people and there are really screwed up people and there are violent people it's it's the entire range of humanity is there yeah but with a different with the the mores loosened in a way that lends itself to extremity absolutely yeah i i, I mean it's interesting because it's not as if my experience being a hippie child was was a bad one. There's things that I love about my childhood. I went to protest when I was young and it instilled in me um, a deep respect and belief in, in protesting things you don't believe in. <laughs> and I also, you know, my stepmom um, is a kind of back to the lander, built her own house with her partner at the time you know, in the woods, and she's unabashedly queer, and taught me about sort of like the joy of resistance and the joys of loving whoever you want to love. Mm -hmm. And to be around that kind of community was liberating. So there were certainly aspects of all that that was, that I, that I hold dear to me, but I mm -hmm. certainly think that hippie culture in general needs more self-reflection on maybe some of the cracks <laughs> <laughs> that it's not all peace and love and because yeah. that's sort of the like stereotype of it we don't rigorously kind of like look at where things went wrong mm -hmm. it's such an interesting world because there there was a prevalence of misogyny and yeah. a very racism racism misogyny patriarchal patriarchal family structures but at the same time there are these really strong women who are very connected with their bodies their place on the planet their connection to um, to their their spirituality and their planet and their identity so you have these really strong women and then you also have you also have men tearing them down uh, it's yeah it's like an and extreme you... expression of what's going on everywhere right. else. And you get moments like my mom lighting his bike on fire, yeah. which I understood right. was, to me, was this great expression of like pure hippie anger, you know, mm -hmm. in that moment. Um, 
but because she was a woman, I think my mom was always viewed as, viewed as the difficult one within mm. sort of the circles we were in because mm. everyone lauded Rick and it was so hard to see that when, mm. you know, as a kid, you just want to be like, but he's the crazy one. <laughs> Do you feel that coming from a family of artists and writers influences your practice? Absolutely. I, from a very young age, always thought that I could do whatever I wanted. And mm -hmm. what I mean by that was, is everyone around me was following passion and creativity. Right. So it never occurred to me that I would have to choose any differently. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I don't think I had some of the same hang-ups or doubts that some of my probably more practical friends have had about making the leap <laughs> towards being a writer because I was around, I mean, particularly my mother has supported herself off her art for many years. Yeah, mine um, too, right? I mean, right. Totally have that in common. Yeah, and so mm -hmm. how, you know, it's not, she never instilled in me like you should go get a regular nine to five job mm -hmm. you know she was like in her studio and coming home with paint on her face and I was like cool mm -hmm. I get to do whatever I want and even if that means being poor that's okay because mm -hmm. we were poor and we we had fun so right. <laughs> it didn't it didn't seem like such a leap for me mm -hmm. yeah um very, very much the same thing, you know, the, the, the right, the right to self define the right to, and also in a, in a way, like with the harm, um, has also come the permission and the skill set to choose your own family. Absolutely. Chosen family. I mean, yeah, but we're raised with people who did that. Right. So yeah, 100%. Sure, that's what you do. Your family screws you up and then you <laughs> and then you find people who don't. Yeah, and then you return yeah, to your family because you understand everyone's kind of screwed up, I yeah. think. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and and then you write about them all. Yeah. Sorry guys. <laughs> um okay, okay, okay. So hippie hippie tropes aside and 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 all of that, I was just blown away by the structure of this book and I mean the writing is the writing is gorgeous I had jealousy there but I had like massive structure envy um I have no idea how you pulled this off <laughs> that's a good question I'm not sure if I totally know so that's yeah. not true I know um I knew from the beginning that I didn't think this would work as like a straight linear narrative why not um because for me, most grief books, it's all about leading up to the death. Mm -hmm. And I wanted grief to inhabit every page. And mm -hmm. so you see her die in the second chapter. Um, I mean, you see many versions of my sister dying. Like five? I, five? Do we four. get like four? We get four versions, yeah. yeah. And they're um, all totally different in, yeah, all. in emotional weight and in outcome and w it, yeah, it's just. Good. Yeah, I actually wrote so all cool. of those in, in, I think it was a day or a day and a half. Wow. Um, I had come up against a writer's block and realized that I needed to lean into the hardest part of the book, which is sort of the, my obsession with what happened to her when she died huh. because I didn't know. Yeah. And so I wrote four different versions of it. I wrote mm -hmm. her dying by accidental overdose. I wrote that someone killed her. I wrote a point of one from the point of view of her dog. Who was yes, her. you did. <laughs> and then I, and then I, in the best thing I've probably done for myself in terms of grieving is I wrote a version in which I got to be with her as she died and hold her and tell her stories until her body was found. Um, so though I knew that I wanted to use those throughout the book as sort of these resting places of deep grief and also to kind of, because I wasn't sure exactly, I'm not sure exactly how she died, I wanted the reader to sort of encounter those as I encountered them, which is in my grief, I would come up with these 
versions or I would hear things about maybe how she had died and I would mm. sort of obsessively create in my mind this narrative of what happened. So I knew that a linear timeline wouldn't work mm -hmm. um, because I wasn't going to have the reader read up to, to her death and then show four versions in a row. So right. I sort of... Um, we, I sort of realized I had these things, I ended up calling them interrupters, which was sort of like sections that interrupted um, the more traditional narrative that was happening. So it was the versions that she, where she died, it was these newspaper articles that start appearing about a third into the book um, that allude to this other crime that has happened that the reader initially doesn't know how it's connected to my sister's death. Mm -hmm. Um, and a few other pieces that felt, I, I guess magical is the best, best word, but they were sort of these like lyrical moments that sort of stood outside of time. Mm -hmm. And so as I was structuring the book, I knew that these needed to sort of be placed very carefully mm -hmm. to give the reader the effect that I wanted. Um, I also have an amazing editor, Kelly Garnett at Bloomsbury, who fiddled with it with me endlessly and including reading the entire thing out loud to me on the phone over the course of a few days. And it was like, as she was reading it and she'd moved to the next chapter, it was like we could hear when something was off. It was like, oh no, 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 that, that shouldn't go there. Um, so, that's no, amazing. Was, that's she's a, amazing, it was amazing. <laughs> that's so, that's, that sounds so old school. Yeah, it, it just happened very organically and yeah. I, um, and my book was fairly short, so lucky for her, she didn't have to read, you know, a hundred thousand word book out loud. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so it was sort of like between sort of this vague notion I had of like wanting to use these interrupters um, to interrupt the the traditional narrative, um, and then and then fine tuning it with Callie along the way, hmm. and in a very practical level, I had a cork board with different timelines were different colors. Mm. My interrupters were white. I had white titles on everything and I spent a lot of time just visually rearranging it because mm -hmm. um, I'm a visual person and yeah so practically that was sort of how I like literally did it. It, it was for me as a reader, uh, magical is the right word for it. Um, it. It felt like a magic trick. So coming into the different versions this this it, it felt like looking at the death of Sarah as a gemstone and you're looking at, looking at different facets and you yes. can see into it different ways. And then there comes a, a moment, and maybe this would be a, a good time to read that, but there, yeah. there comes a moment where it, it explodes for me uh, at least. And I, I love crime fiction, so, um, and me true too. crime. So, <laughs> It was it was really exciting. It became a murder mystery, and I wasn't expecting that coming into it. So it was so it was so rewarding. At maybe it's the one third or halfway through the book, when it becomes this really gripping whodunit story. That even though there are lyrical interruptions that persist, and um, there are moments that are soothing, and there are moments that are horrifying, and uh, things that are healing, and all all of this is going on. Um, but there's that whodunit question and it becomes a page turner, which is just, I felt like it was, whether you planned it this way or not, it felt like a gift to the reader. This is so, it was so much fun to go Oh, through. I'm so glad. I mean, I wanted it to be, I mean, as look, this book is many things and it's a love letter to Sarah, but it's also supposed to be something that people like to read. And yeah. I love mystery books and crime books and, and true crime. And while I wish my life was not reflective of <laughs> those things. I thought, well, here's an opportunity to like put some of that mystery into the book and put some of that pacing into the book and to, to yeah. hopefully lead the reader down this kind of unexpected path where they go, wait, what's happening? And then it hopefully unfolds and you get a clearer and clearer idea of it. Um, did you want me to read a fable? Sure. <laughs> All right. So for those that haven't read the book, there are, like I said, newspaper articles throughout um, kind of talking about this other crime that has happened, but you don't really 
get the whole picture until this chapter is called A Fable. So, the tattooed criminal and the liability decide one night to rob a home. This home, a trailer, sits in a mostly vacant RV park on the edges of their small town. They drive to this property late at night because they know there are drugs, money, and valuables there. They believe the inhabitants of the trailer are gone, out of town for a few days. They take a gun, an old shotgun, sold to them by a friend who stole it from her boyfriend. They say the shotgun is just for show, to scare anyone in case they are interrupted during their crime. They break into the trailer easily. The tattooed criminal has been there several times and knows its weak spots. The liability is directed to look through the closets and small dresser for cash and valuables, while the tattooed criminal works on the safe he has seen the owner of the trailer place things in, drugs, an old watch that he believes is worth a great deal. He thinks he has figured out the code, observing this dealer the few times he has come there to buy from him. Ten minutes pass. The liability has filled his pockets with jewelry, money, and a Pugs dispenser he thinks his kid would like. The tattooed criminal has not been as lucky. He has been unable to open the safe. He kicks and punches and swears, but it will not open for him. In a rage, he picks up the shotgun he has brought and blasts off two shots at the unyielding lock. The two men laugh when it opens for them. They do not think of the noise. The gunshots wake up a sleeping man in a neighboring trailer. He tells his sleeping girlfriend to wait in bed. He will investigate. He encounters the two men as they are leaving the trailer, their stolen goods and reloaded gun in hand. The tattooed criminal threatens the sleeping man, tells him to go back to his home and forget he ever saw them. To prove his point, he uses the shotgun to try and push the man down. It goes off, suddenly and loudly killing him. The sleeping man is now a dead man. The sleeping girlfriend is awake. She has pressed her face to the window and she watches as her boyfriend's body collapses. Maybe she screamed. The tattooed criminal and the liability look up and see her face, distorted in horror. They decide that she should die too. She has seen them, knows their faces, their tattoos, the sounds of their voices. One more shot rings in the RV park. The sleeping lovers bleed and the two men leave. The stolen property is divided up between the robbers, some of it sold. There is tension between them. The tattooed criminal does not trust the liability. Just look at his name. Another person enters this story now. He is simply the man. The man has helped sell some of the stolen goods and drugs. He receives a cut of the profits for his part in the crime. He is an old friend of the tattooed criminal and whispers in his ear, warns him that the liability will rat him out to the police. They're all high, and soon the tattooed criminal is hearing whispers even when the man is not in the room. It is clear that the man does not like the liability. Perhaps he believes that he should have been there the night of the robbery gone wrong instead of the liability. Perhaps he simply wants a larger cut. Late one night, the man and the liability get into an argument in the tattooed criminal's house. There is a knife. There is a beating. The tattooed criminal enters the scene at some point, sees the liability, maybe dying or suffering or living, we do not know. He takes the knife from the man and finishes the job. They do not know how to dispose of a whole body. It's too much for them. The tattooed criminal and the man take the liability into the garage, where there are tools and sharp things. The whole becomes parts, and these make more sense to them. They drive and scatter, like they are feeding the reaper's birds. Three people dead. One shotgun sold by a girl, by my sister. 15 days after the first part of the liability is found, she too will be dead. <laughs> ah, it's so it's so um chilling and um and thrilling for a reader. I mean it's terrible to live through. <laughs> but um I understand completely. Yeah, it it it, it 
it just it just really changed the nature of the book and it and it felt to me so new and fresh and like a different kind of memoir um a memoir that would would also take you to really unexpected and uncomfortable places that are not all about the self that are also about this the things that the things that we do together and that you're also on a hunt and you're you're digging for things it it just it just was so interesting to me um you made a choice in that chapter to rather than refer to people by their names which i understand you might need pseudonyms um for various reasons but you gave them archetypical names which are also capitalized and there, there's the, the girl and the dog and the man and the liability uh, and the criminal and i thought that was a really interesting choice why why archetypes it's interesting because later in the book at various times i use their archetypal names and then i do end up naming them mm -hmm. although mm -hmm. they are pseudonyms mm -hmm. <laughs> um I think for me, this whole, as I was getting this information, you know, about who Sarah had been connected to, it felt like a nightmare. It felt like the worst fairy tale I'd ever read. It had that quality of like dark magic of the, the thing you don't want to remember when you wake up. And so, in order to bring some of that to the book, I felt like I should write it as a fairy tale because in my mind, the man has become this monstrous giant. And he's not, he's a man. He's a man I wouldn't hope to meet and the man who I'm scared of, but he's not a monster. But in my head, he's a monster a lot of the time. Hmm. And so I thought it was, important to bring some of that into the book and I think too part of me felt like Sarah really loved fairies and fairy tales and we had grown up we were big readers growing up we told stories a lot and in some ways it was helpful for me to narrativize it like this hmm. because it provided some distance from like the nitty-gritty of what actually happened and I could turn them into these characters that sort of were like easily vanquished, um, unlike the real people. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I think all of that went into the decisions behind that chapter. And it, thankfully I have an editor that lets me play like that. <laughs> yeah, I, I just, it really, it really felt like such a, um, such an honest inquiry to come at to come at this disturbance which is an understatement but this um this tragedy in your life from so many different angles and to to tell and retell and let me try it as a fairy tale and let me try it as crime a true crime story and let me try it as an elegy and um and it it, it was really striking to me i i say sometimes to newer writers to in in instead of trying to write towards an answer write towards a question that a lot of the most interesting writing comes when instead of arriving somewhere you arrive to another another debarkation point or disembarkation point and <laughs> uh, and that those the changing the changing nature of the question can drive the narrative that can be the plot and absolutely you just you just did that so beautifully <laughs> yeah i mean i think in life and in the work the question is like well there's multiple questions it's like what happened to her and i mean that from like the day she was born to the mm -hmm. day she died mm -hmm. like what is it in our lives and in our family history that turns us into who we are and the choices that we make so there was like all these sort of like huge almost like life questions of like why are we who we are why are we here why do some of us make bad, bad choices and then there was very like small questions like what could i have done differently as her sister yeah to save her um and it was so much easier to focus on these sort of 
actually unanswerable questions. I can't say for sure what happened to Sarah or how she died or what we could have done differently. But that, that act of investigation and inquiry was part of my grieving process. And I sort of have this moment at the end of the book where I remember it too, because it like happened in real time. I was like, I need to, how do I end this? And I realized that the, this, this investigation, this whole book is just a way to avoid the only thing I really know, which is that she died, mm. that someone I loved very deeply died. And nothing I look into is going to change any of that. Mm -hmm. So I don't really answer anything. <laughs> I, I'm still left wondering how she died and what happened to her and what I could have done differently. But I, I feel a lot better having gone through the process. <laughs> and I think it's because I finally came to a place where I realized I'm never going to answer those questions. Uh, and it's okay to not be okay about what happened. Um, well, I think a right. lot of grief memoirs work towards resolution yeah. or a moment of catharsis. Mm -hmm. And at the end, I thought, yeah, I'm never going to be okay about this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that in and of itself is okay. I can live both being deeply traumatized by my sister's death and have a good life. And they mm -hmm. seem like they're in contradiction and they're not. It's yeah. just what life is for a lot of people who experience death and trauma. Yeah, that's what, what felt so refreshing. Well, there are many things that I found fresh about this, but um, the, the honesty around that felt refreshing and beautiful and exciting because it also gives us all permission to live with questions, inhabit questions, allow those questions to be important in our lives and still not need to answer them. Yeah, to live with it, yeah. with that uncertainty. And I think a lot, yeah, a lot of us have to live with that and that that's okay. I, you know, when I read a lot of grief memoirs, I felt kind of bad at the end because I thought, I'm not doing this right <laughs> because I'm not experiencing this thing that they're all having, right. this moment of like, oh, they're okay and I'm okay and we're all going to move on. So, yeah. <laughs> this is like very 1970s foreign cinema of you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I can hear my spouse laughing in the other room. <laughs> um, I guess it's time. It must be time to do the Q and A. I have to. A I have to ask one more thing before we do, though, of course. because the dog. I can't believe you did point of view of a dog. I can't believe you did it, and I can't believe it made me cry. I find it a little bit embarrassing <laughs> that I cried over a scene from the point of view of a dog. Oh, it makes me so happy. Listen, I <laughs> really <laughs> struggled with, I, you know, Sarah wasn't found for four days. Her body was alone in the house with the dog who couldn't get to her. And that drove me crazy. It really, really haunted me. And I felt like this dog loved her so much, even though she was a mess. He would run away and he would always come back to her. And it just felt like I owed it to their relationship, as cheesy as that sounds, to sort of like make space for this animal and his love for her. And also, I was really jealous. I wish I was the dog in the house with her. And I wasn't. He was there and I wasn't. So he became sort of this access point for me. Um, and I can't believe I, my editor let me get away with it. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's an it's an intensely intimate scene, uh, which is right. which is why it moved me so much. I don't cry easily, and that I think that was the only place Excellent. I cried was the dog part. Just got I don't, I don't know. I don't even like dogs that much. It just, <laughs> well, um, good, but, and it did its job. <laughs> All right. Do, do we have audience questions? I have a couple questions. Okay. Um. So, Rose, what do what was your your mom's reaction? to the book did you let her look at it first before you sent it out in the world or um, um did you say this is what i've done and i hope you like it 
my mom very early on let me know that she wasn't going to be able to read it because it was just too hard for her. So she hasn't read it. And I understand that it's um, very graphic descriptions of her daughter dying. So because she was one of the only people that was alive that was in the book and couldn't read it, I just tried to be really mindful of what I included. And I would occasionally sort of say like, oh, I'm going to talk about you <laughs> lighting Rick's bike on fire. And she'd be like, that's fine. So I don't actually know what she would think. And I just think it's just too difficult for her to make her way through. I think that's really, and your mom must be an amazing person. Absolutely. Yeah. Self-aware about her boundaries. About her needs. That. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you have any questions, Aaliyah? Oh, um, uh, let's see. I have a couple more. Oh, no, you go ahead. I was kind of, I kind of questioned myself out. <laughs> well, one of the things that really struck me about the writing was um, your ability to kind of get directly in people's heads. That's, that, that was my thing. And that's what I love about when I'm reading a memoir. I like to to see it through someone else's eyes. And I thought you did that really well. Just what did your editor do? Cause I mean, having your editor read your work out loud to you as you're going through the editorial process is so rare. I mean, you are so lucky. Um, I know, I feel very, yeah. I feel like I just stumbled into like the best editor relationship I could ask for. And I feel very lucky for that. Um, and Callie is a poet, and I think that that really helps. She loves language, and um, she really pays it. She's like a very careful and thoughtful reader. Um, and she was really open to how experimental, I mean, the book in a lot of ways is very experimental because I do inhabit a lot of POVs that are not my own. And she was like, great, let's do it. <laughs> and that was really lovely to sort of be given permission to just take a bunch of risks. Well, I mean, I think that, that that's a writer, that's an editor who sees what her writer needs. You know, that's, Absolutely. you know, I mean, that's what I felt when you were talking about her, that, that she truly saw exactly what you needed to continue this process. A hundred percent. Yeah. It, you know, it's not the easiest book to write or to edit. Um, or even the legal review is very complicated and mm -hmm. Callie was uh, a great support through all of that. And I, it wouldn't be the book that it is without her and without the support from Bloomsbury. Well, I mean, that's what I've noticed about some of the, the quote unquote smaller publishers that they're really willing to let their writers kind of rip. Um, yeah. I felt that way with, with Aaliyah's book too, that they really let her be who she was when she was writing it. Mm -hmm. um, and thank God. <laughs> yes, yeah. Because I mean, that voice they, is what we want to read. Yeah. Exactly. But I mean, I felt the same way with you that, that they just allowed you to be who you are as a writer. I mean, she allowed you to be. Absolutely. And and she allowed you to take the kind of risks that you needed to take in order to produce a book like this. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I feel very lucky for that because not every writer gets that. Kind of very, permission. it's a very rare thing. Yes. <laughs> so thank you, Callie, if you're here, because I think you are. <laughs> Hi, Callie. You did an amazing yeah. <laughs> job editing this book. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so now here's here's the question that I I like to ask um, every writer that I get the great pleasure to to have a conversation with us. What what are you working on now? I am working on a novel about a therapist that doesn't feel empathy. So I get to write delicious scenes where she's in session and you see the great kind advice she's giving to her client. And then you see the real terrible thing she's thinking in her head. Oh, that it's sounds sort of amazing. <laughs> it's sort of wrapped up in a mystery. She is aware that she has sociopathic tendencies. And so she sort of decides to look into a murder that took place in her family before she was born, um, to sort of see if she's inherited badness, I guess. So 
it's exploring a lot of the same things. Like, what do we inherit? What do we take with us? But it's not at all personal. And so I get to do all sorts of fun things that aren't nearly as traumatic as <laughs> this book was. So I was wondering, do you have um, three books that you'd like to recommend to um, the audience for what they should read during quarantine? Well, Home Baked, absolutely. Oh, I it's, agree 100%. A, a good long read. Um, it's also a lot of fun, if, especially if you're a Bay Area person. Oh, 100%. Because you can point I mean, out I'm a the Cal people. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I'm a Northern California girl, even though I live in Southern California now. So it was a delight to like, yeah, it felt like coming home in a lot of ways. What else? Uh, Diane Gina's new book, I want to say it's All Night Sun. All, it just came out. It's an amazing fiction book with some Swedish elements I highly recommend. Um, and Excavation by Wendy Ortiz and Mean by Miriam Gerba were the two books that I returned to again and again during my writing process. And they're both from small presses, so I just like to give them as much love as possible and encourage people to read their beautiful memoirs. Yeah, we need to give we need to give the the small presses a lot of love right now. Exactly, exactly. Alia, do you have any questions or? No, I, I mean I I have all the questions in the world, honestly. But <laughs> <laughs> That, that was wonderful. I feel satisfied. I feel like I had a full meal. Um, yes, I feel like I had a full meal too. <laughs> I just, <laughs> Thank I'm you so, much. so crazy about this book and I hope that everyone goes out and, and gives it's it a beautiful in. cover. Yeah. And so I can good. tell you that we have it right up on the counter at GTP so you can't miss it. And I will send you guys some fine book plates if you'd like. Oh, we'd love that. Yeah, I'll shoot those in the mail tomorrow. You guys, thank you so much. This was so much fun. Yeah, thank you for having me, you guys. Thank you, And Kathleen. I can't wait for the next book. Oh, boy. Give me a, a year or two. <laughs> <laughs> and Aaliyah, hopefully we can do this again with another great author. Sure. Sure, I would love to. Thank you. And I want to thank everybody who's listening, and I want to thank our amazing sound guy, Mike. Let's give him a hand. Yeah. Um, but have a great night, everybody. And, you know, keep reading. Yes. Keep reading. Thank you guys. Good night. Good night. <laughs>